Hey everyone, we are back with another edition of the Edward Jones Chatting Cage. Tim McMaster here, and we are excited to be joined by Rick Riz, longtime broadcaster for the Seattle Mariners. Rick, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Tim, it's great to be with you. We've got a beautiful day here in uh, sunny Seattle, Washington. Second game of the big four-game series with the Angels, and uh, a lot of excitement right now uh, here at uh, Safeco Field with Edgar's weekend. And the way the ball club has been playing this year, Right now tied for that second spot in the wild card. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, they're playing good baseball. Clearly the roof is open yeah. behind you. Fans, you know how this works. Oh, yeah. yeah you can use that hashtag <laughs> chatting cage to get your questions in. Use that MLB fans app or get in line. Use your webcam. You can ask your own questions of Rick Riz. We're going to start on social media. And Kings Court 22 wants to know, which Mariners team do you think was the best you've ever covered? Wow, I, I'd say because of the significance of what they did and when they did it, uh, that 95 ball club saved baseball here in Seattle. Now there was 2001 when the Mariners went out and won a major league record 116 games and uh, was just phenomenal. I don't think they lost back-to-back -back games until the month of August. That was just a great ball club. But considering what the guys did in 1995, and the threat of the ball club leaving a few years earlier and the Mariners playing in the kingdom for so many years and looking for a new ballpark and looking for funding to make that happen. It was the, the excitement of that 95 ball club with Ken Griffey Jr. and Jay Buhner and Dan Wilson and Randy Johnson, Mike Blowers, and all those guys that uh, you know got together. They were 13 games out of first place on August the 1st. Junior tore up his wrist, mashed his wrist on May the 26th of that year at the Kingdom in a game against the Orioles. Kevin Bass hit a fly ball, and Junior slammed into the wall. He was out for three months. But guys like um, Alex Diaz and Richie Amaral and Doug Strange, the, the guys that were 23rd, 24th, 25th on your ball club, really stepped up and did a good job. Edgar Martinez hit 400 in Junior's absence. Uh, Vince Coleman comes over. Andy Bennis comes over in huge trades, acquisitions, because that was the first year of the wild card. Remember, it was supposed to be 94, but no postseason, so we didn't see it then. And without the wild card in front of everybody right there, maybe Woody Woodward doesn't go on get Coleman, who was, uh, you know, a big addition to the ball club, and Andy Bennis, who went 7-2 and two in the second half of the season. But guys like Griffey and Buhner and Wilson and Blowers, little Joey Cora, Randy Johnson, all those guys, because of what they did and when they did it, baseball has not only survived but flourished here in the Pacific Northwest. And now we have the best ballpark in Major League Baseball here at Safeco Field that opened up on July the 15th of 1999. So I, I've got to say that 95 ball club, considering what uh, they were looking at, what they had to do, and they went out and did it. Yeah, great points, and I was thinking 2001, but you sold me on 95. Rick, we have a fan. Okay, ready good, to go, good. Ready to go. Go ahead, tell us your name, where you're from, and ask your question for Rick. Hi, Rick. My name's Joey from New York, and um, my, my question is, what's your favorite part about being a sports broadcaster? Uh, hi, Joey. How you doing from New York? My favorite part of being a broadcaster is this right here. I get to come out to a ballpark. <laughs> every day i don't think i've worked a day in my life uh, uh, prior to getting the jobs i had when i was 14 15 years old growing up on the south side of chicago but i've been in baseball for 43 years now eight years in the minor leagues 35 years in the big leagues 32 here with seattle three years in between with the detroit tigers and just joy just coming out to a ballpark every day being around the greatest guys in the in the game of baseball, like I said, Junior and Jay Buhner, and now the guys here, Robbie Cano is absolutely phenomenal, and Nelson Cruz and Kyle Seeger, and so many of these guys on this baseball team, they have as much heart as that 95 ball club that I just talked about. But I'm living my dream, Joey. When I was 12 years old, I wanted to be a major league broadcast. Actually, I wanted to be the next Louis Aparicio. Growing up on the south side of Chicago, I wanted to be Louis Aparicio, the Hall of Fame shortstop for the Chicago White Sox. That didn't work out. Went to Southern Illinois University, walked out, made the JV team there, but that's as far as I got. But got into broadcasting. When I was 12 years old, I wrote Jack Brickhouse a letter. Jack Brickhouse, Joey, was the longtime broadcaster for the Chicago Cubs. And I wrote Mr. Brickhouse a letter when I was 12. Joey, I wrote him a letter, and he wrote me back. And uh, that letter really helped me out. And uh, so I pursued my dream. And here I am now at the age of 60-something. 
And uh, I'm living my dream, Joey. So whatever it is you want to do in baseball or in sports or wherever it is, you can do it. You know, take a look around, write that person, call that person, and find out uh, how they get in, got into the business. But uh, because I had a chance to contact Mr. Jack Brickhouse, a Hall of Fame broadcaster for the Chicago Cubs for many years, now I get a chance. I've been living my dream for the last uh, 43 years, Joey, and you can too, buddy. Rick, I think you're going to get a bunch of mail now after that answer, uh, asking for, <laughs> for some help from people. It's now time for our EDJ right. question of the day. And the question today is, what's your best memory of Edgar Martinez? My, my favorite recollection of, number one, just being around the guy. One of the nicest guys ever in the history of the game of baseball. Also one of the greatest hitters. But it had to be 1995. Uh, Edgar came up with the biggest hit in the history of the franchise, which was a double. The Mariners went, finally made it to the playoffs in 1995. The first year, they started in 1977, hadn't been to the playoffs until 1995. They had the one-game playoff against the California Angels, and it was Randy Johnson against Mark Langston. Randy won that ball game 9-1, to one, and the Mariners finally got in. And then, so now they had to make a long flight to New York. They lost the first two games of the best-of-five series. Game two at Yankee Stadium, Jimmy Leyritz hit a home run in the bottom of the 15th inning and won game two. So now the Mariners have to fly all the way back home and win three games against the Yankees at the Kingdom. And uh, in the middle of the night, now it's like 4 o'clock in the morning, I got up to the front of the plane and I saw somebody get up. It was Lou Canella. And Lou looked at me. I didn't say a word. And I looked into his eyes, and it was like he had flames shooting out his eyes. He said, Rick, we're going to win this thing. I said, yeah, Lou, we got Randy going tomorrow night. You get game four, you get him in game five. He said, Rick, we're going to win this thing. Randy wins game three. Edgar Martinez in game four hit two home runs, including the grand slam, drove in seven runs, and the Mariners won game four. Game five was unbelievable. It was one for the ages. The Mariners battled back and tied the game late in the ball game. Uh, Randy Johnson came on in relief in the top of the ninth inning. Jack McDowell came on in relief in the bottom of the ninth inning, struck out Edgar Martinez. Now it goes into extra innings. Randy pitched three innings in relief, gave up a run in the top of the 11th inning. Randy Velarde got a base hit. And now the Yankees were leading 5-4. to four. In the bottom of the 11th inning, Joey Cora off of Jack McDowell let off with a bunt base hit. Don Mattingly to this day told me, I don't know how he missed him. He went to his right, dove to his left. Joey head first line into first base and was safe. Junior came up two pitches later. Base it into center field. That set the stage for Edgar Martinez. I didn't know. I don't know if he knew it at the time, but he had the weight of an entire franchise, the weight of an entire region on his shoulders. But I, obviously, he blocked that out. He was looking for a forkball from McDowell. Now a splitter, because that's a pitch that he struck out on. He took a fastball for a strike, and then with two on, down by a run, five four in the bottom of the eleventh inning. Here comes the forkball, the splitter. And Edgar put a beautiful swing on it, a double down the left field line. Of course, Cora scored easily. Junior came flying around third base, fastest I've ever seen Griffey run in my life, fastest he's ever run in his life. He scored. Edgar had the double. Mariners won the game. They won the American League Division Series. That was the biggest hit in the history of this franchise. So when it comes to Edgar Martinez, I can go, I can talk to you for about an hour about Edgar Martinez. But that, if you ask me for one moment in time, that was the moment that helped save baseball in Seattle. Edgar's double down the left field line at the Kingdom off of Jack McDowell. Mariners won the ball game six to four. And you still see all the six images. To five. Yeah, you still see the images from that uh, even today, sliding into home and yeah. leaping into the air with oh. the uh, victorious runs. Oh, yeah. We yeah. have a, another fan getting ready to join us here. Rick, go ahead, tell us your name, where you're from, and ask your question for Rick Riz. Hey there, I'm Noah Brereton. I'm 16 years old. I'm from uh, White Rock, BC. And my question for you, Rick, is... Oh. First team to card spawn push. Yeah, we, we lost him a little bit, Rick. I could, but I we, could hear the question. Yeah, we got his question, yeah. which is, uh, what does okay. this Mariners team need to do to stay in the wild card hunt? Well, that's that's a great question. Uh, they've had so much adversity this year. White Rock, British Columbia, the home of W.P. Kinsella, <laughs> who wrote uh, the book where uh, uh, The Field of Dreams was based on. Great writer, one of the greatest movies of all time. But uh, this ball club, obviously everybody needs pitching here at the end of the season. Their bullpen has been phenomenal. Edwin Diaz, 
23-year-old kid coming out of the bullpen time and time again has been outstanding, especially here in the second half of the season. He had a rough time last night against the Angels. But I'll take this kid in any situation, any time. They could use some starting pitcher right now. James Paxton, one of the best pitchers, not only in the American League but in baseball this year, was out for a month of the season back in May. And even though he was out for a month, up until last night, Paxton had won seven consecutive starts. That tied a Mariners Club record. Jamie Moyer won seven in a row back in 2003. Scotty Bank had won seven in a row back in 1989. And last night, won six in the third innings, gave up three runs and no decision. But Paxton with 12 wins, even though missing a month of the season, one of the highest win totals in the American League, one of the best ERAs in the American League. So I don't have any official word yet on Paxton. He came out of the ball game with a strained pectoral muscle, hopefully – Hopefully, Paxton is going to be all right and won't have to miss any time. So we're kind of keeping our fingers crossed there. But everybody right now, and it's tough to do because now you have to go through waivers to make a trade after the uh, trade deadline on July 31st. But you can still make deals. Jerry DePoto has been outstanding for this ball club as the GN acquiring Yonder Alonso just a few days ago last Sunday from uh, the Oakland A's. So uh, everybody could use, uh, I think, starting pitching right now if you can find it. And if Jerry DePoto can find it, He'll make this ball club better down the stretch. He's been unbelievable the last uh, two years, creating depth in this organization. The Mariners lost four of their five starting pitchers in the first two months of the season. Felix Hernandez went on the DL. James Paxton. Drew Smiley hasn't thrown a pitch all year long. Hisashi Wakuma went on the DL. Giovanni Gallardo was the only guy. And then later on, he lost his starting role, went down to the bullpen, was great, and now he's back in the starting rotation. The Mariners have used 53 players this year 36 pitchers 15 different starters this year so through all that adversity there they are tied for the second spot of the wild card along with tampa bay half game in front of minnesota game in front of the angels and also the baltimore orioles so it's really a minor miracle how the mariners have been able to do it i give scott service his coaching staff a lot of credit jerry depoto for creating depth in this organization for guys like ariel miranda for sam gavilio who you'll find on page 288 of the Mariners Media Guide, and Christian Bergman in the first half of the season, who really held the fort and gave the Mariners an opportunity to be in this position for the guys to eventually come back, like Paxton and Felix, who's now on the disabled list for a second time this year. Mariners also lost uh, Gene Segura, not once but twice on the DL. They lost Robbie Cano on the DL for 11 games. The Mariners went 3-8. and eight. Segura was out early in April with a hamstring pull, Later on in June with a high ankle sprain, this guy's been incredible out there at shortstop, getting on base on that leadoff spot. He's really changed the dynamics. But like everybody else, the Mariners in particular, it would be nice if they could beef up uh, somebody in that starting rotation because hopefully James Paxton is okay, so we're kind of keeping our fingers crossed. If anybody can pull off another trade, it's certainly Jerry DePoto, Rick. That is for sure. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go back to the He's MLB Fans app, and this probably – Maybe related to the cat we saw in St. Louis the other night about craziness <laughs> around baseball. But the question is, it's from Dave the Brave. He wants to know, what's the strangest thing you've seen on a baseball field? Well, I tell you what, i got to go back to the Kingdom days. And, and that episode there uh, reminded me of what happened in the Kingdom. The Kingdom was a breeding ground for uh, a lot of cats. Uh, they kind of liked it in there to get out of the rainy northwest weather during the uh, winter months and uh, when spring came around there were a lot more kittens and cats all over the place and one of these cats decided to run out of the field during the course of a ball game and we had a we had a cat delay so unfortunately for one of our groundskeeper uh guys uh we nicknamed him bird i don't know what his name was but he, he his nickname was bird ran out to left field to go get this little cat so we think, oh, how cute is this? You know, a little kitten on the field. Bird's going to go out there and pick it up, take the cat off the field. We got a little kitten delay. It was a tiny little thing. So Bird goes out, gets the cat, corrals this cat finally, picks him up, puts him in his arms like this. All of a sudden, that little cat turned into a mean lion. It chopped down on his finger, and all of a sudden, Bird is spinning around like a top. He's trying to get rid of the cat like this. The cat is hanging on to his finger. And, oh, my gosh, finally the cat let loose. Or he let loose to the cat, and uh, my goodness, he ended up picking up the cat and getting it off the field. But unfortunately for Bird, he had to have a lot of rabies shots, and uh, it was funny at the time, but not so funny. I really, really felt for the guy. But, uh, yeah, we had a cat delay in the kingdom, too. 
Yeah, that, <laughs> that is an amazing story. And so similar to what we saw in St. Louis with the, the, yeah, the yeah. violent cat as well. Uh, this is the Edward Jones Chatting Cage, and we have another <laughs> fan ready to go. Go ahead, tell us your name, where you're from, and ask your question for Rick. Uh, hey, hey, Rick. I'm, I'm Jack O'Connor from Warwick, New York, uh, Bloom's, Bloom's, Bloom's Corners Road. And I was wondering, um, what, when when you were when you were young, what what sports did you play, Rick? What's when I was, uh, well, nice to talk with you, buddy. Uh, yeah, when I was young, yeah. I played all sports. And uh, you know, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. And uh, when spring came around, when the sun came out, uh, me and my buddies ever see the movie Sandlot? That was the story of my life. We I was so fortunate, so blessed to have a Sandlot behind my house. We had 20 houses on one side of the street, 20 on the other. I had all kinds of friends to play with. We got a bat and ball and our baseball mitts, and we went out there and played baseball all day long. So spring and summer, it was nothing but baseball every day. But then when winter came around or fall came around, we played football in that field. We played a lot of football. Man, I was I wanted to be Gale Sayers, you know, or running back for the uh, Chicago Bears. So we played a lot of football. And then winter came around, and we played basketball. At our local elementary school, we had uh, a league where all us kids got together and uh, played basketball until it was time for uh, spring to thaw out uh, the snow. And even during the winter, we had two firemen who lived on our street. And when it snowed, and it snowed a lot back then, back in the 60s in Chicago, we'd bank up the snow into a rink we try to make it as big as we possibly could, about a foot or two feet high of snow, and form a rink. And then the firemen would go get their big hoses from the firehouse, hook it into a fire hydrant across the street at the Miller's house, drag it through the Logan's backyard into the field, and flood the field. And then the next morning, we'd have a couple of inches of ice, and we'd get our skates on and go uh, do a little ice skating during the winter. So I encourage kids to play every sport, not just baseball. Play baseball as much as you possibly can. But I think it, it helps your body and your mind to understand what all the sports are about. Play basketball, play football, play soccer, uh, tennis. Anything you get your hands on with a ball and a bat or a tennis racket or, or whatever, go out there and play the game and, and just have fun all season long. But, uh, oh, I played baseball, Little League baseball. I played in high school at Eisenhower High School on the south side of Chicago. Then I walked on and, and played baseball at Southern Illinois University. I made the JV team there. We had a great ball club. Went to the College World Series in 1974, my junior year. I was on the JV team. I got into broadcasting. But uh, that's, that's what I played, uh, you know, as far as I could go until I was about 20 years old. I played about two and a half years on the JV team in college. But I played all sports when I was a kid. I loved it all. Great stuff and great stories uh, from Chicago back in the day. Uh, we have another question from social media. The Kid Jr. wants to know, Rick, and you've been broadcasting for a while there with the Mariners, how do you feel about advanced statistics and how they're kind of changing the game? Oh, they're amazing. I mean, take a look at this right here. I mean, we've got it all right here in this thing. This is just called the stat pack. Here's the standings for Major League Baseball, and we've got uh, – all the stats from the Mariners and the Angels tonight. We got all the league leaders, uh, and but then <laughs> this is this is just the basic stuff. And then you can go on and on and on about Babbitt uh, War, which I still don't get. You know, I've been around the game for a long time. <laughs> uh, I see a number for War, 4.2 War, but we've got all kinds of analytics right now. Fortunately, there's a lot of smart people in the front office that can figure those things out, get them down here to the clubhouse for scout service, for the coaching staff, disseminate that information to the players so it makes sense out here. So now you see the defensive shifts and how, you know, the defenses play, a left-handed hitter, right-handed hitter, and where that ball is going to be hit. 85% of the time you play the percentages. So there's all kind of analytics right now. And But I was talking with scout service about that a couple of weeks ago, about, you know, using the numbers. The numbers are great, and he uses the numbers – but also, he's been around the game for a long time. Former catcher in the big leagues. He's here for a reason. He non knows and understands the game of baseball. And he's got his own gut feeling. And he told me, I just want to make sure the numbers match that what I'm seeing. So you have to have both. The analytics are great. They've really changed the game of baseball. How we even broadcast you know, the game right now. Because we have that information right in front of us. And, and how he uses that to make sure that 
what these numbers say are really matching up out there because when it comes down to it, he's got to make a decision right here, sitting inside the dugout, to do what he has to do to try to win a ball game. So they both go in hand in hand, and uh, but the numbers, if you take a look at them, uh, really, really tell a story. That's that's those are the numbers that I like. If they really tell a story about a player and a team, then they then they really make sense, you know, to me. Tremendous, insightful answers, Rick. Thanks so much for joining us. We're out of time here on the Chatting Cage. Oh, let's go another 20 minutes. We're good. <laughs> My son is out. We've got a big weekend. Edgar Martinez weekend. His bobblehead tonight. His retirement of his number 11 uh, tomorrow night. They're flying a big number 11 flag right now over the Space Needle. Edgar Martinez, one of the most popular players in the history of this franchise, one of the greatest players in the game of baseball. Writers out there, get please get Edgar Martinez in the Hall of Fame because he deserves it. Take a look at his numbers. 21 guys in the history of the game of baseball have a career batting average over 300, on-base percentage over 400, slugging percentage over 500. The other 20 guys are in the Hall of Fame. The Edgar Martinez Drive is named after him right here. The Edgar Mar the Designated Hitter Award is named the Edgar Martinez Award, and he's the only guy that hit 400 off of Mariano Rivera. He's got the biggest hit in the history of this franchise. Take a look at the numbers. Take a look at the numbers, and trust your eyes, too. I watch this guy put on a uniform every day and play for 18 years. He's not a part-time player. For those of the writers that have a problem on the DH, you know, we put the best outfielders in the Hall of Fame, the best infielders, the best pitchers, the catchers. Put the best designated hitter in the history of the game of baseball in the Hall of Fame, Edgar Martinez. He belongs there. Thank there, you, guys. There you go. That's why Mariners fans are lucky to have you calling the games as well. It's going to be an exciting weekend out there in Seattle. Thanks for joining us, everybody, in another edition of the Edward Jones Chatting Cage.